In the name of the one who came in flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. So when you've spent most of your career being the, the youth pastor guy, you get a lot of chances to preach on Christmas Day. And every year when this comes around, I start to threaten, mostly within my individual group of fellow church nerds, I'm just going to read a sermon from an old patristic theologian named John Christosom, and that's just going to be it. That's, I'm not going to write a new one. What, what else is to say about Christmas? I'm not going to do it. So I'm just going to read this sermon. I'm going to get up there, and we'll let the chips fall where they may. And I always chicken out. Now, this, 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 serm, this sermon written by uh, Christosom is a, a, name, a nickname that literally means, he has a literal nickname that means golden mouth. And he's one of the faith's great preachers, he was a monk at heart, but ultimately a preacher in practice. And like I said, I've chosen not to make us all suffer through the stilted language and honestly kind of long uh, sermon that was written around the fourth century. But if you want a copy of it, let me know. I can give it to you. But I can never shake completely the reason why that sermon always pops into my head at that, this time of year. He writes, Bethlehem this day resembles heaven. Hearing from the stars the singing of angelic voices, and in place of the sun, enfolds within itself on every side the sun of justice. Ask not how, for where God wills, the order of nature yields. For he willed, he had the power, he descended, he redeemed, and all things yielded in obedience to God. So it goes on from there, but that's the part that kind of actually rolls off the tongue a little bit better. But I get struck by these words every single year, not only because they're beautifully put and a, about as concise of a, of, a, of a systematic theology as you're going to get in one document, but it's also, I start thinking about the power of the incarnation. It's Christmas, and it's one of those things that we know is coming every year, but it's kind of wild to think about this moment where all of a sudden, he who was, now is. Jesus being born into the world. And I, I love the theological reality of the incarnation. As I was re reading this sermon and writing it again, I was thinking, oh, this is pretty much what I said on Sunday. And I realized that it's because the incarnation is core to how I think theologically. It's a moment when kings and emperors and all powers and principalities are put on notice. On this day, something is changing. And it's a moment where simple fishermen the outcasts of society were children and women and those who thought they could never hear the liberating words of redemption, who could never be that close to that kind of power. They sit a little bit more upright because something is changing and something is different. It's a moment where all of us suddenly get a gift of courage. We get the encouragement to risk actually believing in hope. We get the opportunity to get wrapped up and swept away by the grandeur and grace of a God who chooses to claim the world, not through a seat of power, but through a baby in a dirty stable. And again, this is my core to my theology, and this is why, again, I think every time I get a chance to, pre to, to preach on, on Christmas Day, I don't think about it as a, as a oh, well, here we go again, but instead a chance to actually proclaim what the gospel is. We are being claimed by God. And think of the ramifications of what that means, what it means for God to claim all of us individually, but this entire world, theologically, politically, 
socially. Because if you have what I like to call a long view of the incarnation, it's impossible not to see today, Christmas Day, as both the beginning and the end of God's reign in the world. The beginning is God claims us. And the end is God claims us. These are two sides of the same coin. The work of the incarnation, the picture of, as he says, Bethlehem resembling heaven, means that the world has fundamentally transformed. And no matter how much we try, no matter how much the world tries, it just simply can't go back after that. Jesus came, and in that moment, the world changed. Something's different Something has changed, and it can't go back. And I couldn't help myself. Here's another part of that sermon. For this day, the ancient slavery is ended. The devil confounded. The demons take to flight. The power of death broken. Paradise is unlocked. The curse is taken away. And sin is removed from us. Error driven out truth has been brought back, the speech of kindliness diffused and spreads on every side. A heavenly way of life has been implanted on the earth. Angels communicate with men without fear, and men now hold speech with angels. Why is this? Because God is now on earth, And men and women are in heaven on every side, all things commingle. Though being the impassable word, he became flesh, that he might dwell among us. He became flesh. He did not become God. He was God. He became flesh so that he whom heaven did not contain a manger would this day receive. He was placed in a manger so that he, by whom all things are nourished, may receive an infant's food from his virgin mother. So the God of all ages, as an infant at the breath, at the breast, nestles in the virginal arms that the Magi may more easily see him. Since this day, the Magi too have come and made a beginning of withstanding tyranny, and the heavens give glory as the Lord is revealed by a star. Let's spend a moment, even if it's just a moment today, being awestruck by the idea of the Christ coming to dwell among us. Let's spend the next days and weeks and months, even years, telling the story of a God who came to earth a God who loves the the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever shall believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A God who claims us. A God who knows that when Jesus shows up, something will be different. Something will change. And that change is the gift of the Incarnation. It's the gift of Christmas. Because the world has changed and maybe we don't notice it, and sometimes it's hard to notice. But every Christmas we get the invitation to once again see the world differently. We get an invitation to live with that sort of radical hope and more import, most, perhaps most importantly, to be able to say with supreme confidence and with all of the voices of heaven backing us up that God is in this place. Amen.